What's up guys, Alexander here with Date Psychology. I hope that you have all been doing well and I wanted to give you an update with the channel with some recent things and share some research with you today as well. So right now I have a new camera and mic set up. Hopefully with the audio quality in particular it's better. Let me know in the comments if it sounds okay or what adjustments you guys think still need to be made. Aside from that, I have a new article, a very large article, up on the website, datepsychology.com. This is about the relationship between testosterone and personality, testosterone and behavior, and testosterone and physical muscularity, as well as athletic performance. So it's up. You can read that. And if you don't want to read it, don't worry, because I'm going to make a video summarizing that for the next video very shortly. Now that I have the new setup and now that I have finished that, article I should be able to make these a little bit more quickly for you guys so since I haven't made a video in a little while I want to do something a little different today and I thought we could go over some recent research that caught my eye I'm going to share five studies with you guys can't go into them in a lot of detail I'm going to go over them very superficially I'm going to describe them kind of like you would read in the abstract and let me know if any of these catch your eye. If there are any of these studies that you guys really like, I could go over them in more depth in the usual format where we do a really deep dive into what the study says. Or we could even look at similar research. Some of these I might even decide to cover at a later date. It's all new research in any case. So new studies, interesting things across a few different fields that I wanted to share with you guys. Let's go ahead and look at the first one of these right now. This study is called Similar Neural Responses Predict Friendship. And this is a neuroimaging study. Neuroimaging, what does that mean? It means pictures of the brain using an fMRI or a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine. Right? When you see pictures of the brain in a bunch of different colors in research, in articles and all of that, that's usually what is going on. It's an fMRI. When you see all the waves and stuff, that might be, you know, a cap measuring electric impulses. This is scanning and measuring uh, electric activity in the brain. So I've mentioned in the past assortative mating, right? That people select partners who are similar to them, specifically in the context of income and attractiveness, as we saw in the last video, but across many, many different traits, right? Particularly personality traits. We see that in friends as well. Probably shouldn't call it assortative mating since they're not mates but assortative selection for friends. And here we have in this paper another piece of evidence, another piece of research adding to that. Because what we see is that the brain activation behavior of friends in response to stimuli is more similar than the activation response of strangers with that same stimuli. So how should we interpret this? People who are more similar track each other down and become friends, right? And it's probably not just a superficial similarity. It can be a functional cognitive similarity, which is what these brain imaging studies imply, that there are structural differences, or in this case, structural similarities in the brain that we even select for, obviously unconsciously, when selecting a friend. And most likely, if this is occurring with friends, probably with romantic partners as well. Here we have another study. This is called Examining the Attractiveness Halo Effect Across Cultures. The halo effect, you have probably heard of this because it's very popular, the idea of it, and it is very well established. This research, I don't know if it's an exact replication of past research, but it certainly replicates findings from past research, right? Which is that physical attractiveness, we're looking at facial attractiveness in this study, predicts perceptions of positive personality traits. Positive personality traits, in this case being intelligence, confidence, trustworthiness, sociability. When you think of traits like the big five, those are also predicted by the halo effect, right? Conscientiousness, agreeableness, extroversion. And most all of the personality traits that they measured in this study had positive correlations with physical attractiveness. What made this study good, good design, cross-cultural study, right? It was conducted in 41 different countries across 14 different world regions. The effect is established all over the world. So we know it is not just a specific cultural thing, right? Like, oh, 
is this a Western beauty thing, for example, that people associate good with beautiful, seems to exist across cultures, across all of the world. And additionally, they found negative relationships between physical attractiveness and negative personality traits. So similar, like we see the halo effect, positive traits are assumed to exist in a greater quantity in individuals who are attractive. Negative traits are assumed to exist in a lesser quantity in attractive individuals, right? So kind of the both directions there with that. The third study up here, and this is by a, an author. Her name is Linda Leidborg. I covered her research in the past here. It was a meta-analysis of male reproductive success and bodily attractiveness, right? Attractiveness from the neck down that found the only variables that predicted male reproductive success in the body for bodily attractiveness were muscularity and strength. Here she is again with another meta-analysis, very well designed, uh, where she looked at female physical traits and if they predicted reproductive success. The title of this paper is Do Women's Morphological Traits Predict Reproductive Outcomes? A Systematic Review. So morphological traits, in this case, being traits that we tend to think of as signaling female fertility. And this is kind of a point in this paper, is that a lot of the traits that we have assumed are signals of female fertility have not actually been tested directly. And tested directly, what does that mean? Well, are we looking at an actual correlation between something like hip-waist ratio, which is believed to be a cue of fertility, and the actual number of offspring that a woman has, the direct measure of reproductive fertility or reproductive fitness? When the authors of this paper went through systematic review, they found very, very little in the way of studies that were actually testing this directly. That's probably the largest takeaway from this paper is that a lot of the traits that we associate with female fertility have not been experimentally linked, or I should say, uh, not ex well, I could say experimentally, but it's not actually an experimental design in any of these cases, but have not been empirically linked with female fertility. And examples of these traits would be something like neonatinous features, right? Large eyes, smooth skin. Another example would be large breasts, the hip to waist ratio is one that is discussed very often that they couldn't find any research in the systematic review that actually linked that with number of children. So what they did find was that the 2D, 4D ratio represented most of the research linking a fertility trait, or I should say a sexually dimorphic trait with fertility outcomes. That ratio, the 2D, is the ratio between the 2D and the 4D digit in the hand, right? It's going to be smaller in men, particularly with men that may have had higher prenatal testosterone exposure. In women, it will be larger. Why? Because their finger will be smaller. So this is actually a trait that they found small effect sizes, but positive effects with fertility. Interestingly, that's not a trait that we tend to think of as having sex appeal, right? No one is thinking about someone's hand unless you're you know, that Jojo character that's obsessed with the hands. But yet that seems to be the only one that has been empirically linked with actual fertility. This is kind of an interesting paper because it illustrates how we tend to create perceptions, particularly in the form of pop psychology, perhaps not based very strongly in the research, but they snowball and they become more and more and more popular because certainly a very popular explanation, if you ask someone, uh, particularly in evolutionary psychology, or, and not even necessarily a psychologist, but just someone who's familiar with the field, you know, you ask them, you say, why is the curvy waist so attractive? And they say, oh yeah, big hips, it's a sign of fertility. Well, apparently from the research, we don't really know that because it hasn't actually been tested. And if it has, perhaps it hasn't been published because that's a thing as well to keep in mind is publication bias means that sometimes when no effect is found, right? When you can't reject the null, when you fail to reject the null, the paper doesn't get published. So either way, not really looking good for those associations. We shouldn't interpret this as saying that they're not linked, right? Because 
the absence of evidence is not evidence for the absence of the effect. But going forward, it's something to keep in mind that research has not closely established a link between these things we think of as fertility cues. Here is an interesting one. The title of this paper says, Lookalike humans identified by facial recognition algorithms show genetic similarities. What do we mean by lookalike humans? We're talking about doppelgangers, people who are not related but who look remarkably similar, almost like twins. So they found these doppelgangers, right? People who facially look incredibly similar to one another. And I think they even used a data set from an artist who tracked them down uh, for photos. But both methods of collecting a sample there. And they looked at their genetic profile and they found that people who have these remarkably similar faces also share a great deal of genetic similarity beyond the genetics that would contribute only to facial similarities. So it may actually be the case that people who look incredibly similar to one another also are going to be a little bit more similar in personality or behavior. This is interesting because it's of course reminiscent of very early theories in psychology, kind of discredited theories at this point, which were kind of like that physiognomy, right? The idea that people's faces tell you a lot about their personality, they would say. Ah, he has a large forehead and protruding eyebrows, right? So that means that he has a criminal. He's likely to be predisposed to being a criminal. Ah, you can see that he has narrow eyes, which means, and they're bright eyes, which means that he is intelligent. And these kind of associations with personality and facial features go back really, really far in human history. I believe you can see in the recruitment of Roman legionnaires where they'd say, ah, this person has bright eyes or sharp eyes. You can pay them a little bit more. You can put them in a uh, role that requires higher intelligence because they viewed that as a sign of intelligence. I'm not a historian. Don't quote me on that, but it's something that I have read. Certainly in the late 19th century, we still see a lot of that in early psychology. Well, it looks like we're kind of going back in that direction because now we're seeing that some recent research indicating that people who look alike may actually be kind of similar in other ways as well. And the last study here, the title is No Evidence That Siblings' Gender Affects Personality Across Nine Countries. Good. So here again, we see kind of a cross-cultural observation. So good to know right off the bat from the title. And what are we looking at here? We're testing the idea that home environment influences personality. Home environment, in this case, specifically being the difference between having a sibling at home who is a brother versus a sister, right? It's very commonly believed in popular culture that the home environment has a huge role in how children develop, right? This is a very, very popular idea. A lot of recent research in psychology is actually indicating counterintuitively that this is not the case, that home environment plays a remarkably small role in child development. Instead, what accounts for that? Well, the environment outside of the home, the non-shared environment, part of it. The other part of it, genetics. In behavioral genetics, and I have talked about this in the past, there's something called the 50-0-50 rule, right? Which describes contributions to behavior or personality. The first 50% being genetic. This rule is kind of derived from the observation across all sorts of different research that ah, about half of behavior is heritable or attributable to genetics, right? Heritability being a estimate of genetic contribution. The zero in the 50-0-50 rule is the home environment or the non-shared environment. And the other 50, or excuse me, the shared environment, and the other 50% would be the non-shared environment. There's a researcher, his name is Kanazawa, He's a researcher of genetics, heritability, and intelligence specifically who has written about this. Uh, very good. If you look up his name, if you're interested in this topic, you will find some very interesting things. But this is something that is, I say, it's counterintuitive, right? Because it's very, it's not how people think about child development in popular culture. People who are not in psychology studying this sort of thing, they think, of course, the home environment has a massive role 
on the way that a child develops. It's all about how you raise them, right? People say that about dogs also, right? About uh, different breeds of dogs, right? It doesn't matter what the breed of the dog is. It's all about how you raise them. Well, in the field of behavioral genetics, at least, that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to be that the home environment of a child actually has perhaps much less to do with their outcomes than the environment outside of the home and the genetic contribution of their parents. This study, just another piece of evidence in that growing body of evidence indicating that home or shared environment plays little role in children. Why? Because there was no difference between children raised with a brother or a sister. Should there be? Well, you would think that behaviorally, boys and girls are very different. And so growing up with a boy in the house versus a girl in the house, if the home environment plays a big role, perhaps that would influence your ideology, right? The way that you think about women, the way that your extroversion comes out, if you're more or less agreeableness, if we're going to talk about big five traits or any other personality measures. Well, what they're finding here across nine countries is that none of their personality measures looked at were actually related to having the sibling in the home or not. So something to consider there. And I'm going to sign off now. That's five studies. I'm going to make another video for you guys very quickly on the new article on testosterone and personality. Check the website, datepsychology.com, if you want to read that first or just wait for the video. If you like this, like, subscribe. If you liked any of the studies in this, leave a comment if they caught your eye, caught your ear. We could go into them more in depth in the future. And since this is a new camera and a new mic, leave a comment. Let me know how the sound is and if you think I need to make any changes for upcoming videos. Thank you guys so much and I'll make another video very, very soon.